one of my favorite things to do when we go on vacation and we go to the beach is to build a sandcastle. I'm going to get to that in a second. Don't show it yet. But let me read through this text real quick. And then we'll continue on. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of His hands. Day after day they pour out speech. Night after night they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to the whole earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens He has pitched a tent for the sun, it is like a bridegroom coming from his home. It rejoices like an athlete running a course. It rises from one end of the heavens and circles to the other end. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever, and the ordinance of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey, dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them there is an abundant reward. Who perceives his un unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule me, then I will be blameless and cleansed from blatant rebellion. And here's probably the most famous verse. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. God's creation and word reveal his glory and perfection. That's our main idea this morning. God's creation and word reveal his glory and perfection. So we look at Psalm 19 this morning. He gives us the psalmist in verses 1 through 6 a testimony of what creation declares. And in verses 7 through 13, he gives us a testimony of what scripture declares. And then in verse 14, he concludes with a prayer for holiness. Like I mentioned, one of my favorite things to do uh, as a kid, and now even as an adult, is to build sandcastles when we go to the beach. Uh, I really enjoyed getting out there and, and making those sandcastles, kind of getting my hands dirty a little bit. And one of the things about sandcastles is if you, if you get, um, you know, you have to find this perfect balance of how far away from the water am I going to be. Uh, if you get too far away from the water, the sand is too loose to actually build a sandcastle. If you get too close to the water, you can make a decent sandcastle, but then it just gets swallowed up by the water. So you've got to find that sweet spot where where can I get really good sand and it's not going to get swallowed up. This is something that all the kids have to do. I mean, you can boogie board on the ocean. You can swim in the ocean. You can surf. You can lay out. But for me, building sandcastles scratched a creative itch. And uh, it wasn't just exerting energy. I was, I was building something. I was building something from nothing. I got to fashion it. I got to put a little moat around it. I got to see how long it would hold up before the water swallowed it up. Kids enjoy doing this. Grown-ups enjoy doing this as well. You see this picture from Hampton Beach, one of the professional sandcastle builders in a contest. And you see there's an older gentleman that's still in love with this idea of creating, creating a sandcastle. This idea of creating isn't new to us. It's something that has existed for all time. And in many respects, when we create things, whether that's sandcastles, whether that's creating art, whether that's creating in the kitchen, whether that's tricking out your car, when you're creating things, you're participating in a creative activity. You are mimicking the creative work of God. A lot of times people want to dismiss art. They want to miss, dismiss songwriting. They want to dismiss painting. When you create things, you are in a way, as an image bearer of God, mimicking God's creative work. 
That's why art is good. That's why song making is good. That's why being creative in the kitchen is good. That's why building sandcastles is good. Because you, as an image bearer, are participating in the ultimate act of creation. You're mimicking that on some small level. But unlike God, you started with the ingredients. If you're in the kitchen, you probably had flour. In the kitchen, you probably had butter, milk. You had the ingredients around you. When God started with creating, He had no ingredients. He had nothing around Him. He created things out of nothingness. And God, the Creator, spoke His creation into existence. And ultimately, He did so to bring Himself glory. God's creation exists for God's glory. We watched an episode of Everybody Loves Raymond a few weeks ago. And there was this question that one of the kids asked their parents about why God created us. Why do we exist? And the whole episode comes from that kid's question about why God created us, why do we exist. They spend the whole episode with these parents trying to fumble through to get an answer on why God made us. They couldn't find out why God made us. They tried to become philosophical, but they fumbled. They tried to go to the Bible, but they couldn't find the exact verse that they were looking for. They were, they were beginning in you know, kind of Leviticus, trying to fi- find that answer out, right? They couldn't figure out why God made this to offer that explanation to the kids. So, if you are like Raymond and Deborah, you've got kids that are asking you questions about why we're here, or maybe you have that question yourself, let me just lay that to rest. God's creation exists for God's glory. You want to know why you're here? That's why. God's glory. There is no other reason. There is no other explanation. That is why you are here and here today. In fact, not only does it exist for His glory, it testifies to His glory. The same way that Isabel sat here, stood here, testified to what God did in her life. Creation testifies to who God is, to His glory. So read with me again here in verse 1. You see the heavens declare the glory of God. Oftentimes we mess this verse up. We confuse it to read the heavens are the glory of God. But they aren't the glory of God. They declare the glory of God. The heavens aren't God's glory. They declare God's glory. They are a sign. Just like when you're going up 95, you see the In-N-Out Burger sign. The In-N-Out Burger sign is not In-N-Out. It is something that is pointing to the restaurant. If you go up to that sign, you'll find no burgers there. You'll find no fries there. They are simply, it is a sign pointing to the actual restaurant where you can find your burgers and you can find your fries. When you look to the mountains, when you look to the sky, when you see the scars, the stars in the heavens, that is not God's glory. Those are signs that point and declare God's glory. We don't worship the creation. We worship the Creator. The heavens declare the glory of God and the expanse, this is now tapping into Genesis 1-8, the expanse, that is the sea, that is the land, it proclaims the work of His hands. Literally, His handiwork. Now, does that mean that God actually has hands? No. That's not what the psalmist is saying here. God doesn't have hands like you and I have hands. The psalmist is using what we would call anthropomorphic language, imagery, so that we might understand the creative work of God. Because we can't fully understand God. God is using human words, human imagery, so that we can try to understand a little bit about His creative work. Understanding that God does not literally have four fingers and a thumb. In verse 2, it says, Day after day, those created things, in verse 2, pour out speech. This is a continuous action. Like if you're looking at a stream coming down a mountain, they pour out speech. They testify night after night, continually echoing over and over again about who God is. They're communicating a knowledge of who God is. And in verse 3, it says, There is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. So they're communicating 
this knowledge, but there's not any speech, and there's not any words. And so even without speech, even without words, these things are getting the point across about who God actually is. How is it possible to convey an idea without ever speaking words? How can the mountain speak this idea without ever actually saying it about who God is? So perhaps in this service, certainly in services across uh, the world of Christian churches gathering right now, there's a mom that's shooting a look at her child sitting down the pew. Now, she's saying with her eyes, if you don't stop talking, God is going to pinch the back of your arm. Right? In that moment, she never said a word. But in that look, she said everything she needed to say, right? We know it is possible to communicate an idea without ever speaking words. The mountains, the stars, the heavens declare the glory of God without ever having to say a thing. And the message that is conveyed is that there is a God. It's possible to convey that message without saying anything. And what does that message convey? Worship and glory the Creator. Worship and glory the Creator in verse 4. You see, this forcefulness of their testimony communicates across tribe and across language. Their message goes out to the whole earth and to the words with, to the ends of the world. Across tribe and across nation, whether you speak English, whether you speak any other language, those images convey the message that God wants them to convey. And in the second half of verse 4, in the heavens He has pitched a tent for the sun. In verses 5 and 6, it says this, It is like a bridegroom coming from his home. It rejoices like an athlete running its course. It rises from one end of the heavens and circles to the other end. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The sun is simply chosen here as an illustration because it is one of the most visible illustrations of God's creation glory. Not because it's the most glorious thing. It's just one of the most visible things. No matter what part of the world you live in, you will encounter the sun at some point. It's a, a consistent testimony. So whether you live in the beach, whether you live in the mountains, whether you live north of the equator, whether you live south of the equator, the sun is something that we can all universally recognize that exists. It is a constant participant and a testimony of God's glory. Now, in error, many ancient peoples worshipped the sun, just like many modern peoples worship Mother Earth. But the psalmist is saying here that Yahweh is the creator of the sun and Yahweh is the one to be worshipped. Not the sun itself, but the creator of the sun. And notice here he gives a couple of illustrations. He talks about the bridegroom and about the athlete. No man moves with more purpose on his, uh, than on his wedding day when he's waiting for his bride down here at the end of the aisle. He may have a thousand things to do, but guess what? He'll get all thousand things done so that he can be right here waiting for his bride when she walks down that aisle. He is purposeful. He has a mission for that day and a sense of purpose. In the same way, an athlete who's running a race has a course to run. He's navigating a course that will get him to the finish line. We see that in the Olympics that are going on right now. There's a course that has to be run for all of the track athletes. They're either running around the track or if they're doing the marathon, they have a specific point of navigating from this point to the next point. So they have a sense of purpose, and they, have a, and they have a course. For both the bridegroom and the son, there is purpose and there's trajectory. God's creation in this way is moving on purpose, and it has a direction. Let me say that again. God's creation is moving on purpose, and it has a direction. That's exactly what's being conveyed here. So I just want to lay this to rest. My friends, you are not particles floating around in this great universe without a sense of purpose and without a sense of direction. God has both purpose for your life and He has direction for your life. There is an intelligent design to everything that's been created, which means that there is an intelligent designer behind it. God is moving you on purpose and He's moving you in a direction. The sun's very presence in the sky not only displays God's glory, but it gives you a little bit more time to win your lost friends to Jesus. Every day that the sun comes up, it's another day that you can be a witness for Christ. Not only does it testify to who God is, not only does creation testify to who God is, but 
But the Scriptures do as well in verses 7 and following. Look with me in verse 7. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. Testimony of the Lord is trustworthy. It is perfect. It is renewing. It is wisdom producing. It makes the inexperienced wise. And in verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, sweeter than honey, dripping from a honeycomb. Look at all the adjectives that the psalmist is using to describe the Word of God. When I say the Word of God, I'm referring to the Scriptures as we have it. It's perfect. It's renewing. It's trustworthy. It makes you wise. It is right. It is radiant. It lights up all around you. It is pure, reliable, more desirable than gold. It is sweeter than honey dripping from the honeycomb. It is sweeter than that cup of bluebell ice cream. Sweeter than the pineapple whip that you found at the store. Sweeter than the Krispy Kreme donuts with the hot sign on. Sweeter than all of that stuff. The Word of God is sweeter because all of that other stuff fades away. Your gold fades away. Your pineapple whip melts. But the Word of the Lord endures forever. Notice how the psalmist continues in verse 12. Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Now that he's heard from creation, now that he's heard from Scripture, he prays this prayer. Who perceives his unintentional sins? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is no one can clearly perceive his unintentional sins. We sin sometimes on purpose, right? We know what God's word is and we just do it whatever we want to do. Sometimes we, we sin in ignorance. We don't fully understand God's word, what he wants for us, and we just do something in reaction in the flesh it's not until later that we realize that that was, that was a sin. It has become commonplace in our society to say, follow your heart. But that is one of the most dangerous things that you can do. Yes. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is more deceitful than anything else. It is incurable. Who can understand it? Don't follow your heart. Follow God. Follow God. Instead, make your prayer, like the end of verse 12, by asking God to cleanse you from your hidden faults, from those things that you don't, uh, you're not aware of that you're doing that are wrong. We need divine grace to show us our faults. We need divine grace to acquit us. We need divine grace to restrain us from the practice and free us from the power of sin. We need divine grace. In verses 13 and 14, we see that our only chance to be blameless is divine grace. Our only chance for our words and our thoughts to be acceptable to God is divine grace. God is both concerned with our speech and with our heart's condition. God is concerned with our speech and with our heart's condition. I want you to hear this, so tune in. The clearer our view of the law, the more clear our sins. The clearer our view of the cross, the more clear His grace. The clearer our view of the law, the more clear our sins. The clearer our view of the cross, the more clear His grace. So let's put legs to this this morning with four points of application. Number one, evangelize. Number one, evangelize. Now you're probably asking, Pastor, how do you get evangelism? Out of Psalm 19. Well, let me read just a little bit from Romans chapter 1. And it might clue you in a little bit on this. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 and following says this, For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and against all unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And here it is. 
The truth is this, since what can be known about God is evidenced among them because God has shown it to them, speaking to creation. And how did he show it to them? In verse 24, his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of this world being understood through what he has made. And as a result, people are without excuse. So God has revealed himself in two ways, through his creation And through His Word, God created the world, the stars, the mountains, the oceans. They all point to the fact that there is a Creator behind those things. Those things give evidence to the fact that there is a higher power. And their obligation is to pursue Him, to know Him. And yet at the same time, those things give evidence to the existence of God. They still don't give a way for people to know God. The mountains, because they are speechless, don't give a way for people to know God. The stars and the sun, because they are speechless, don't give a way for people to know God. They know of His existence, but they can't know Him. God has provided a way into His presence, and that way is Jesus Christ. Because acknowledging God's existence isn't the same as being in His presence. Acknowledging God's existence isn't the same as being in His presence. Being in His presence is only made possible through the cross of Christ, the blood of Jesus who says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Very exclusive statements there by Jesus Himself. And since people are without excuse because God has left us enough evidence out there in creation for them to know Him, they're going to one of two places. They're going to heaven or they're going to hell. That's it. That's one of two places, and we firmly believe that. We must evangelize them. We must tell them the good news of what Jesus has done in our lives, knowing that there are only one of two destinations. So let me read a little bit of an encounter by Penn Jillette. Many have heard of Penn Jillette, right? Here in Las Vegas from Penn & Teller. Penn is actually an avowed atheist. He doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in the Bible. But here are his words that he had about an interaction with a fan after one of his shows. He was signing autographs after a show when he noticed a, a man sitting over to the side of the crowd. And this guy, I guess, had been in one portion of his acts during the show. Uh, he had kind of been the, one of the psychic comedians during the show. And he comes up um, and he has this joke and he says, Um, I've got this book in this envelope and paper and stuff, and the man walked over to Gillette and complimented him on the show and handed him a Gideon's New Testament. And he said, I wrote in the front of it, and I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of proselytizing. And then he said, I'm a businessman. I'm sane. I'm not crazy. And he looked me right in the eyes. It was really wonderful. I believe he knew that I was an atheist, but he was not defensive, and he looked me right in the eyes. He was truly complimentary. It didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And and this is the words of Penn. He says, I always said, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and a hell and people could be going to hell or not, getting eternal life, and you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward, And atheists who think people shouldn't proselytize, who should just leave me alone and keep your religion to yourself, how much do you have to hate somebody not to proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you, and I didn't believe, and and you didn't believe that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point at which I tackle you. And this is more important than that. Did you hear what the words of somebody who doesn't even believe in God just said? I don't respect somebody who doesn't share their faith. If you really believed what you say you believed, then you'll share your faith. You'll evangelize. Number two, worship the Creator more than the creation. And I would just say, worship the Creator. Don't worship the creation at all. So back to that verse that I was reading in Romans chapter 1. I'll go back to verse 20. We'll read it all the way through 25. For His invisible attributes, 
that is his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. And as a result, people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over to the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. And they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served what has been created instead of the Creator who is to be praised forever. Amen. Worship the Creator and not the creation. Unfortunately, Christians have garnered this stereotype of being unconcerned for the environment. And I imagine like all criticism, probably some of it is fair and some of it is unfair. Perhaps much of that criticism has come from the fact that we don't uh, necessarily deny the science behind global warming. We just refuse to, to see global warming as an existential threat. I know how the story ends. Jesus Christ comes down riding on his white horse and he makes all things right that have been wrong. I have no fear that global warming will be our uh, demise. What's going to be our demise is when the creator of the universe comes back down and judges all. So you'll have to excuse me if I'm not ready to jump on the panic bandwagon. But we would also be foolish to think that the way we live in this world has no effect on the world around us. In fact, Scripture is pretty clear about the relationship between a person's actions and the consequences for their actions. If you eat red meat all the time, you're probably going to get heart disease. If you smoke cigarettes, I imagine your lungs are going to look like a charcoal grill. The way that we live does have an effect on the people around us. That, that is biblical. And as Christians, we have a responsibility to steward well the things that God has given to us. We have an obligation to take care of the land, to take care of the air, to take care of the creation that God has given us dominion over. But there is a definite difference between stewarding the world around us and worshiping the world around us. Because at the end of the day, we don't worship Mother Earth, we worship Father God. Number three. Embrace the Bible. Embrace the Bible. Because it's perfect. Praise the God of the Bible because He is perfect. If you need to decide today, you need to decide today on how you feel about the Bible. It is either all God's Word or not at all. There is no room for you to pick and choose what is inspired by God and what is not. You need to take Him at His Word or you just totally need to walk out of here and never come back. But it's either all God's truth or it's no God's truth. He's either Lord, he is lunatic, or he is a liar of Jesus. He's either Lord, lunatic, or liar. He's one of those things. He could not make the claims that he's making and not either be a Lord, a lunatic, or a liar. You need to decide today what you believe about Jesus. Are you going to take him at his word or not? When we say that the word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit, we believe that there were actual human authors who penned these words. Different authors writing to different audiences, using different genres, employing different literary devices to say all that God wanted to say. Not in English, but in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. And we believe that the Holy Spirit gave them the words to say. And furthermore, we believe that the Holy Spirit superintended the writing process and the compilation process to bring all 66 books of the Bible today that are the Word of God. And when you get to the early church fathers, and you have this idea that they were sitting down making some haphazard decision, a political decision about the Council of Nicaea somehow coming up that this was the Word of God, let me just affirm to you that the 39 books of the Old Testament were solidified well before the Council of Nicaea. And the books of the New Testament were widely recognized as authoritative well before that council ever convened. There was no haphazard rolling of the dice on what was going to be in and what was going to be out. The canonization process was much more spiritual than that. There are five different things that we use to determine what was going to be in the scriptures, what was going to be considered the word of God and what was not. The canonization process. When we say the word canon, it refers to the Greek measuring stick. This is the measuring stick 
by which we understand what is God's word and what is not. Here are the five criteria. Number one, is it authoritative? Is it authoritative? Is it thus saith the Lord? If it doesn't meet one of those criteria, it's not in it. Secondly, is it prophetic? Does it come from an Old Testament leader or a New Testament apostle? Does it come from a validated source? Thirdly, is it authentic? In other words, is it consistent with other revelation? This is where that extra biblical book, the book of Enoch, goes off track. Now, Peter actually quotes the book of Enoch in 2 Peter. But we don't include that in our canon because ultimately we don't consider that revelation from God. Because Enoch is inconsistent with the rest of the revelation of God. Peter and Jude both cite that in their biblical arguments, but we don't include the book of Enoch. Enoch is said in the book of Enoch to have descended back down from heaven. But if you remember your biblical studies of Enoch, Enoch was actually taken up by God into heaven. And the only person who will descend from heaven after they've ascended to heaven is Jesus Christ. That's why the book of Enoch is not in. Because it doesn't line up with the rest of Revelation. So it, may, it fails the authenticity test for that reason and others. And number four, it has to be dynamic. It has to demonstrate God's power. Many have questioned why the book of Esther has been included in the Old Testament. After all, the name of God is only mentioned one time in the whole book. But the book of Esther is dynamic. And while the name of God is only mentioned once, the entire book displays God's sovereign power. Throughout that book, God is shown to be retaining a remnant for himself using this woman named Esther. God is saving this small group of people to further his name and keep his promises by raising up Queen Esther for such a time as this. That is why the book of Esther is included, because it demonstrates God's power. It is dynamic. And the fifth requirement for canonization is, is it received? Is it received? Did the churches who received these books acknowledge the legitimacy of the authorship? of the claims. Those things that weren't from God faded away because the churches didn't recognize them. Those things that were of God were recognized, taught, and retained. Those are the five criteria. The Bible that you hold in your hands isn't some product of a weird agenda. It wasn't haphazard. It wasn't uh, politically driven. It was basically settled on as Christian teaching well before the councils were ever convened. The Pope at that point, was not in the same power position that he would be in the 400s and the 500s, and then later on in the Middle Ages when it would get weird with papal power and those types of things. The Word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is perfect. It makes the ignorant wise. It's radiant. It's sweeter than honeycomb. The Word of God is perfect because of its own testimony. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It says so itself. And here's further proof that the Word of God is, is perfect. It survived so much bad preaching. As A.T. Robertson would say, it survived so much bad preaching. At the end of the day, thousands of years later, surviving all that bad preaching, all of the bad church practices, all of that, it still stands here today as the most popular book ever written. Number four, pray for and pursue holiness. Pray for and pursue holiness. You have not because you ask not. What we do for God can never compensate for who we are. Let me say that again. What we do for God can never compensate for who we are. It's possible that you could be called to do something that you're not qualified to do. It's possible that God has called you to do something in this life that you're not called to do. Take, for instance, Moses. God called Moses to lead the people out of Israel that was the first part of his calling. The second part of his calling was to lead them into the promised land. But then he gets to Mirabah. The people start complaining about a lack of water. And what does Moses do? He strikes the rock in disobedience. Instead of speaking to the rock like God told him to do, he strikes the rock. Now the people get their water. But Moses disobeyed God. And because he disobeyed God, he couldn't do what God had called him to do. And that is to take the people into the promised land. And God sees that, but He does not bless this. He says, Moses, I know I called you to lead the people into the promised land, but you disobeyed me. And so Moses, I'm just going to need you to stop right there. Joshua, Joshua, come over here. I'm going to need you. And Joshua is the one that ends up taking them in. Saul is commanded to kill Agag. He's commanded to kill the whole nation, all of its people, all of its cattle. Yet Saul chooses to leave the king alive. 
Saul chooses to leave some of the choice cattle alive. And then all of a sudden, Samuel comes and he says, hey, I thought you were given a mission. And Saul says, hey, I did that mission. And Samuel says, well, what is that? I hear cattle lowing in the fields. It's the cattle you left alive that God told you to destroy. You didn't do what God told you to do. And so the Holy Spirit departed from Saul that day. And in the very next chapter, we see Samuel going to anoint the future king, David. Maybe God has called you to do something that you've disqualified yourself from doing. Or perhaps, maybe God is calling you to do something this morning. That if you persist in the sin that you're doing right now, you will take on a disqualification for. Do you want to take yourself out of the running for what God wants for your life because you're going to insist on doing a particular sin? If there's that sin in your life, maybe God is calling you this morning, I know He is, to quit it so that you can do what He's called you to do. To not disqualify yourself from that. To pray to Him. To pursue holiness. Holiness is, is consistent with His character. It's revealed in His Word. It's personified in His Son. And it's empowered by His Holy Spirit. So verse 13 kind of leaves us in a fix, right? It says this, Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Don't let them rule me. Then I will be blameless and cleansed from blatant rebellion. We are rebels without Christ. God is storing up wrath, and He's going to pour that out on those who are not in Christ. If we persist in willful sins, if we continue in unintentional sins, without Christ, we are doomed. But then there's verse 14. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Lord, Jesus is our redeemer. Because of Jesus Christ, he is our rock. He takes away our rebellion. He takes away our rebellion and he washes our sin away. He takes our willful sin and he washes that away. He takes our unintentional sins and he pushes them to the side. He cleanses us through his death and through his death on the cross and through his power. Jesus is not merely the Redeemer that brought you back from an eternal death. He is the rock strong enough to anchor you in your new life. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roar your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word this morning. Lord, you just, you're so good. You've given us evidence all around us that you are here, that you are real. And Lord, you've given us your word so that we can know you and we can have a personal relationship with you. Lord, in this moment, I just pray for those who are wrestling with what to believe. And Lord, I pray that, that you would help them through your Holy Spirit to choose you, to choose life, to choose a good life. So God, move in this time in Jesus' name. Amen.